welcome back to Piano Book. This is a special one, this one. For the last oh, 70 odd days, we've been catching sunrises. That one wasn't particularly much to talk about, but as a means of showcasing your amazing pianos, amazing demos. And we now have a YouTube channel where you can go and browse by looking at sunrises. A bit abstract, but I've enjoyed it. Uh, it's been an incredible journey, quite a challenge physically and mentally, but um, I think one of the things I've enjoyed the most is to really get to know some amazing music and some amazing instruments. I've done a thing with a carrot and a glass and the breaking and it's very silly, but it's linked above and below. But it's kind of interesting because it's unleashed in my mind a new kind of approach to sampling that I think for Piano Book could be very interesting indeed. So let's take it back a step because there's some stuff I really want to take you through. There's for me, a totally new way of thinking about sampling, which I would certainly kind of file under watch this space. If you recall, we recorded a, a round kind of small glass bowl with 10 velocity layers, which I totally recorded free on my kitchen table using this Shure MV88 Plus mic. It basically just goes straight into your iPhone. So free of the grid, into my iPhone with this mic. And we're working in at 120 BPM, and I decided to place these at these different marker points, five bars apart. So at 120 BPM, five bars is exactly 10 seconds, which means each sample is 480,000 samples apart. Right, so contact version. I am hearing a difference there. It's interesting, isn't it? And you'll see I've totally matched the two instances. So what I've done is, because it's a percussive instrument, I'm almost fudging round robins with just velocity layers that are very close to each other because it's not like a massive like bass drum. It's, it's relatively a small difference in bandwidth between and... So basically these are the four velocity layers of the 127 that you have apart. So there's the same there. And what's interesting is if we go into the sample mapping, the sample starts, you'll just see that these are multiples of 480,000. And what I'm doing is I'm just going one sample shy of the next sound because I've cut it hard to these markers, it basically means that no matter how long you sustain it, it won't go into the next sample. Now, it seems terribly wasteful to have all of this digital silence in an audio file, but audio is cheap where space is concerned. And for me, this 120 BPM and kind of 10 second gap feels like a good length of time for a whole multitude of instruments. And that's what I'm thinking about at the moment is a genericism, a template for sampling that is easily interchangeable between different instruments. This is what I'm really excited about. What do I mean? Okay, so again, if you didn't see the Make Music Day videos, uh, what I then did was I found a different set of samples and I made new sample instruments in less than five clicks. It can be done. Simply put your samples on 1, 6, 11, 16, 21, 26, 31, 36, 41, 46. God, my eyesight's so bad uh, apart. Every, every sample is, is, is five apart, giving us 10 seconds. Right, so I then... Then what I did is grab myself Dave. And what I'm loving about Dave is you can now just pick up a sample instrument from, from anywhere. So I'm going to load from this set of templates that I've created. Now you'll see there's no sampler formats in there. And when I go like this, it's searching for a this sample doesn't exist dot wav. So I'm going to cancel that. Let's just quickly bounce that. And this is what you have to do with EXS because it's terribly fussy. And if I could reach out to the Apple team, I would say I would defuss this because the potential is massive. I'll show you what I mean with contact shortly. But here we go. So this underscore sample underscore doesn't without a hyphen exist like that. So I'm going to pull up Dave. Right. So let's try loading it in again. If you remember last time it gave us a prompt was looking for that um, sample. But the one thing about 
EXS, Dave, is it really does know where everything is. It's very clever at finding stuff. So let's see what happens now. There we go. And it just loads. And has it loaded with something? Yes, this sample doesn't exist. I think that was four clicks. So a just totally usable. Okay, so if we move on to the third thing I sampled, which is a big wine glass, I'm going to show you just a couple of observations about the difference between contact and EXS and then Dave and then I'm logic sampler and then I'm going to show you where I think the future of this slightly different way of working lies. And I really do think it's quite interesting. So again, recorded into my iPhone, we've got the quietest level, loudest level. So what I'm going to do is instead of saving this as uh, this sample doesn't exist, I'm going to just name it properly. Big wine glass. There we go. Again, working 120 BPM. Everything is you know, all of these silences included in the audio file free of charge. Okay, now what I'm going to do this time is load up contact and again, go to load the template. And instead of pointing it towards the actual sample called this sample doesn't exist because that's not this wine glass one. I'm going to browse for the wine glass one, which is where I just saved it. Big wine glass. So again, I've created a sample instrument from that bounce file in about three clicks. If I was to say, do a whole range of kitchenware stuff, is I could create a template and provided I make a recording that works within that template, then I can literally make hundreds of sample instruments in quick succession. The only problem with the logic sampler is that it's not quite as agnostic as to the titles that you can use for your samples. So what I'm going to do is, is hide this by going one like that and I'm going to load into EXS the template. Okay so locate this sample doesn't exist and then I want to point it like I did the contact towards this sample. So the big wine glass sample. It doesn't let me load it, which is annoying. So what that leaves us with is this uh, thingy here. So let's just try to see if we can... Okay, big wine glass. Ooh, interesting. Fantastic. So that's a quick uh, swappy rata there. However, I have a suspicion. Look at the sample starts and the ends. You'll see it's reset the whole thing. And what's particularly frustrating about this is, although it's a great text editor, you can see that I can't isolate single columns to cut and paste into. And I don't know about you, but that just makes me want to run around the studio and have a massive tantrum. So what I'm going to do is use the template to just simply copy these amounts. And there we have it. Right. So, I mean, not the end of the world, but if it was a more deeply sampled instrument, I think prohibitive as a technique of creating templates that can almost also build samples, but according to your specific specifications. Something I really wanted to kind of highlight by working in this manner is it, it cuts out a lot of steps. It's not, obviously you're still recording, you're still editing, you're still kind of moving stuff around and making sure it's all kind of nice post-production, but what you're not having to do is title stuff and rebounce and recut and all of those processes that we do and have learned how to do in piano book. I think that this is a potential method of development as well, because instead of having to work within EXS or indeed within your contact window, all you have to do is work it within the window of the door of your choice. Let me give you an example of this. Say, for example, I'd forgotten to record zone seven. Now, the net result of that, if we just totally remake this. OK, and let's point it towards what we've just saved there. There's a hole, this gap, as we'd expect. But the smart thing about it is if you are missing a sample, you could just simply re-duplicate another one further down the line.
and there you are, you, you have it back. So theoretically, and in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new MVP piano, which is much more complex than our original MVP, maybe a few round robins, a few dynamic layers, pedal on, pedal off, to a strict specification. But it's not a problem if you don't want to have all of those features, because all you do is you simply duplicate whole sections of your arrangement as part of the developmental process. You can maybe come back another time to do a softer layer or on another piano. Or indeed, in the case of this, I just want to maybe just to put a couple of Easter eggs in. Nice and subtle. Right, a piano book wouldn't be complete without a... As you know, Piano Book is a community of composers who make sounds and share them for other people to use for free. Now, we've had a few cynical comments over the years saying, well, they're not really free because you have to buy either Logic or Contact, which I do empathise with. But it's kind of like saying this company is giving away free air fresheners for cars. Well, they're not free because you have to buy a car to put them in. Another comment people have made is, well, why don't you develop your own sample platform for Piano Book? Well, in order to do that, you've got to be the daddy. And seeing as it's Father's Day, I thought we'd just focus in on the daddy. Contact. You see, with Dave, or Logic Sampler, or EXS, whatever you want to call it, it is for one door, one operating system, and a single hardware architecture. And that isn't an easy undertaking. Look, it's not changed for 22 years. Take Halion. Now, this is by order of magnitude a harder, yes, it's for one door, but it's for a multitude of operating systems on totally different, sometimes improvised pieces of hardware architecture. Now, to make a sample engine that is door agnostic, operating system agnostic, and works on any piece of hardware, you're talking of EXS24 cubed, whatever twice cubed is. It's an insanely difficult proposition, which is why Contact is the daddy. Now, we're not sponsored by them by any means. Obviously, with Spitfire Audio, we partner with them. We think Native Instruments are a great company. But there's a great summer deal on at the moment. And whilst you may think Contact is very expensive, even these updates or cross grades. So say, for example, you've got a copy of Albion. This is your chance to get a full copy of Contact. All I can say is, just for Piano Book alone, if every sample instrument on Piano Book were to cost you $1, that would cost you $320, which is considerably more expensive than Contact is currently. And I would argue that there are many instruments on Piano Book that are worth considerably more than that. The Rolling Piano by David Bergman. After wanting to sample my home piano for a while, I got around to recording it at the end of last year. Hearing many well-recorded and sampled pianos there already were on Piano Book, I decided not to traditionally sample mine. Here lies my first experiment. I sampled repeated notes played at varying time intervals to create a kind of swarm or rolling effect. It's best played as sparse chords. I especially enjoy the lower octaves. The samples are all looped at different points, so you can hold a chord and the same pattern will never repeat twice. Absolutely beautiful stuff. Um, lovely GUI. It's got a great, um, I don't know quite how you've done this. Which is just, it's great kind of effect curation for something that is totally idiomatic with the piano. Brilliant. Something I have done, if you don't mind, is I've massively increased the release. I find this is great for kind of just jamming cues that are drone based for drama. You see, don't hear the notes coming off, particularly if I do a brighter one like this. Absolutely 
beautiful. Now, something I'm going to do is what I would really urge people, if you're doing these tremolo andy things, is you won't believe how slow you can go with the tremolo andy. Um, and it still sounds really kind of quite frenetic when you start building up the chords. When we did the mandolin swarm, which is the first swarm that Spitfire ever did, one of the real difficulties was was uh, dictating what the tremolo andy, the slow tremolo andy should be, because there were 25 mandolin players. And the minute they all started playing even a slow tremolo andy, it just became this sheen. So I said it's actually it's an aleatoric repeated note. It's ding, din, din, din. Bim, 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 that kind of stuff. And the minute you start building up the chords, you still have this beautiful shimmer, but you can still hear every note. Now, this is going to be full of artifacts because I've put uh, AU pitch on. Uh, so I've basically what I've done is I've um, pitched it down and then pitched it back up again to exactly the same point, but just to reduce the number of uh, notes, if you know what I mean. The Lamp, created by Flo. This is a lamp by Ikea called Jakobsbien. It's placed over our dinner table. Corona forced me to work from home, and so our dinner table had to move and make place for my iMac. Unfortunately, the lamp is placed quite low and close to my head when I sit in front of my Mac. I've banged my head countless times in the past couple of weeks. It did hurt a little bit, but it also sounded quite nice. So this week, I finally brought an AKG Z414 XLS from my studio and sampled the lamp. Now, not every sample we make needs to be ma. This is just expertly created with, I think, uh, the magic of agnosticism in sound in mind. Now, with Celeste, the minute you start playing one of those, you go directly up Daniel Radcliffe's bottom, and suddenly you're in the wizarding world with glockenspiels, you're banqueting at the table of Fiona Apple. With something like this, it's... It's non-specific. Tapped that lamp. It has a refinement to it, but an unfamiliarity, which I think is really helpful when creating tension, that kind of stuff. Even if the sound is quite sweet, it has an otherworldly nature that I think is really important. If I played that on a piano, the listener would associate it as music as opposed to it just melding into the background and someone going, this scene is making me feel tense. Worth bearing in mind when creating your own personal sample libraries is absolutely go big in jazz hands, but it's the simple stuff that's really useful too. The Mason and Hamlin Model A by Dora M. My father passed away earlier this year. We were lucky enough to have a funeral before the COVID-19 lockdown, but because all of us are sheltered at home, we can't go to his house and sort through the family belongings. In his house, there's an AB Chase Baby Grand Piano that I learned to play on. It's out of tune, it needs a total overhaul, and we fear that it will end up in the junk heap as not many pianos from the golden age are being restored unless they have Steinway written on them. I'm a big fan of this one. It's a piano that doesn't hide behind the kind of furry veil of a felt. It is fait accompli, a piano that has been well played and played well, I think, uh, bears all of the signatures of everyone that's uh, uh, had a go on it. Um, but it's been, it sounds like it's been beautifully maintained and I just think it's wonderful and it's it's bright and it's bold and it's it's what it is. It's this personality. It's that piano there. Joshua's Martin, created by Joshua Meltzer. Of all my instruments, this one I am probably most attached to. They only made 250 of these Martins. After playing about 20 models, I heard this one and grabbed it. It has a warm, rich tone, so I thought I'd try to sample it. S 
lovely. When I reviewed this on the site, something I'm going to get back to in a minute, um, I said that for me, the sound of this is a great way of demoing up guitar parts to then replace with a guitarist. I mean, something that I think is really also important to think about when you are writing guitar parts is, is whether the guitarist can actually play it. I think as keyboard players, we think, well, whatever we can play on a keyboard can be played on guitar. It doesn't work like that at all. So actually finding... We all know riffs like that. And I think it's quite handy to have a guitar around, even if you never track it and you can't play it, to actually pick out the notes that are possible to play. Because when you play the samples, they'll sound more, more realistic. But also when you get to a guitarist, he'll actually be able to play it. Another thing which is great with a sound like this is to actually record yourself. As a piano player, I'm feeble on the guitar. And in fact, the guitar sounds feeble when I play it. But by layering something like Joshua's Martin and my humble or feeble rather efforts, uh, I get something that is, is passable. Uh, there's a doubled one as well in here, which is great. But the secret jewel in this guitar crown is this pad. I just think one of my favourite ones that have been made on the site. And it's interesting because I've always maintained that ambient synth pads are much better if they're made from organic sources. And I think the master and commander of the, the ambient synth pad is Brian Eno. But I suspect it really is Brian Eno and Daniel Lanois, who's a pedal steel guitarist, very much developed Edge's guitar sound. And I suspect that, in fact, when we're creating Brian Eno-esque ambient synth patches. In fact, they were never synths in the first place. Comments down below. Dan Bow Pad, created by Bunker Samples. I've lived in Vietnam off and on since 2013, and I've always had a deep fascination with traditional Vietnamese instruments. I have an ever-growing collection of Vietnamese instruments, and the Dan Bow is my favorite of them all. It's a monochord, and is traditionally played by plucking the string with a long bamboo pick while stopping it at a natural harmonic with the palm of your hand. It's very difficult to play properly, since only the notes of the harmonic series are available, and all other notes are produced by changing the tension in the string with a flexible bamboo handle. It's great to see Bunker samples back. Absolutely one of my favourite developers. And it's been great to follow Nikolai's progress with Bunker, which I believe has become a successful business. You see, with Bunker, there's always a story behind it, and the sound always honours that story. And that's why I think composers and producers and music makers make better sounds than tech companies. And that's why I think, as part of what we do, we're soundsmiths, as well as lyricists, as well as top liners or arrangers or orchestrators, we also make sounds. So why not make that a commodity that you can sell? And it's great to see the likes of Bunker, the likes of David Hillowitz and others using Piano Book as a means of celebrating what they do, yes, of taking us on their journey, but also directing traffic towards their commercial operations. I wholeheartedly support this. Pointillism Guitar, created by Sam Stewart. Recently, I've become mildly obsessed with sounds that are somewhat chaotic yet beautiful at the same time. I wanted to try and recreate this feeling in my own music and decided since I've never created a sample instrument before, it was about time I had to go at it. The samples were made using my Fender Telecaster I've had since I was 14, moving in minor thirds from C3 to C6. I recorded 12 takes on each note playing tremolo at random and inconsistent speeds. I recorded this directly into my audio interface, adding some in-the-box processing. Absolutely enormo guitar, and again, with apologies if it's terribly rude of me, um, I've uh, made the release enormous. In fact, the release for the right hand is more than it is for the left, so that's erroneous. But again, it's that ability. Say, for example, what I'm going to do is got the two C's here, create a drone, and then I'm going to drop down to this C. Now, I don't want it, that to suddenly feel like it's dropping out. Again, if I'm just kind of jamming live with picture.
Let's put it together with the rolling piano with all of those effects on. What I love about that kind of layering of similar instruments is it obfuscates what they are. You'll often find with directors, oh, I don't want guitars, well, I don't want pianos. Well, that is just a, it's, it's a guitar, is it a piano? And, and you don't get the associations. I was talking about Daniel Radcliffe's Bottom and Celeste. Hoffman 114, created by Ackerman. This is an instrument recorded from my Hoffman 114, but new 38 years ago when living in France. It has been my constant companion ever since. Always looked after, never misses its annual tune, and has followed me around Europe, survived umpteen removals, two children, and periods of storage, and is now safe at home in the Netherlands. Lovely. Now it's interesting, you've got, also got a felt pass, which is on a fader. Absolutely lovely. So combine the two. And some strings. Interesting. Now, I have an idea. It's quite mono sounding, not the strings, but the piano itself. So here's one I prepared earlier. What I've done is you've got two round robins. So this is very, very unpure of me. I've taken the round robin without the felt, pan that left. And I've taken the first round robin of the felted version and pan that right. And then the other way for the second round robin and the other way for the second felt round robin with the idea that we're going to just fool the ear into thinking this piano has got a much much kind of broader stereo image so let's have a listen to how that sounds no that just sounds silly actually no i say silly it's actually quite an interesting effect that's something you'd hear on your headphones and go how did they do that but if i play chords you do get fooled. Yeah, the panning does sound a little bit um, uh, sideshow, but... Um an interesting way of making something suddenly ping hard left and right. Celeste, created by Pierre Caillé. Hi, I'm Pierre Caillé, a French film music composer. During the COVID-19 pandemic in France, we are all confined. All productions are stopped, recording studios and mixing facilities are closed. To be with my family, I've stopped going in daily to my own studio, and the days are long. To do something, I started to sample some instruments laying around the home. Then my friend Jan Volsi proposed that we record his Mustel Celeste and do a contact program for a piano book. Brilliant. And no sign of Daniel Radcliffe's buttocks anywhere. Again, because it's just so unique, it is its own story. It is its own thing. And um, I just think it's wonderful. I'm going to use it on so much stuff. Now, right, which brings me on to a subject which I wanted to discuss with you. I think one of the ways at the very least that we can repay the huge amount of effort and the love that goes into sharing what are ostensibly things like family heirlooms, family stories, pianos that were owned by, you know, grandparents who have passed away, this kind of stuff, is to at least uh, not necessarily write them a thank you note, but at least to do a review. It's important on a number of levels. A lot of people start their sampling adventures here, and I think the feedback provided, it's not cruel and it's kind and it's constructive, I think is really, really useful. Why did you give it only one star? Well, because it's not quite edited right, this, that and the other. It'll inspire people to improve and inspire people to possibly help. When approaching the reviews, 
what I do is I just think about how us composers would find them useful. So I'm honest, but not in an egotistical way. It's not about, well, stylistically, this isn't my bag at all. I wouldn't have used that microphone. It's more, how would I use this in a real world, world scenario? So with Joshua Meltzer's guitar, for example, his Martin, I put down that this is very much uh, something that I would use to mock up stuff and then replace. But the most important thing, I think, for this as a project is moving forward, we're going to want a hierarchy to evolve, not in the contributors, but in the samples, in the fact that some samples are going to be more accomplished than others. It's a simple fact. And I think it's really important that those absolute blockbusters rise to the top to the surface. And the ones that maybe are slightly more practice runs are understood to be that and are supported in accordance with that. I don't think it's fair to judge, say, someone who started sampling a glass bowl this week with something that maybe John Meyer has made. And whilst we're using carrots this week, uh, as a carrot without a stick, um, if you could maybe go back and think about maybe the three or four or five uh, samples that you use often, if you can go back and rate them and review them, that'd be much appreciated. But also, we are dreaming up, can't promise anything yet, but we're dreaming up a competition that's going to really reward people who have given something back. And it's such a simple and quick way of doing stuff. So my overall re rating is four. Uh, it's so easy to get ahead of myself and go, that's brilliant, use it on everything. It's a five. Well, it has limitations and that's what makes it beautiful. It's not a, a, a workhorse for everything. But also I understand as a community, if everything's five stars, it's just literally pointless. I don't know if that's going to be any use. Proof that character and history behind an instrument will relieve us of the dangers of conjuring up the world of Harry Potter every time we dare to use a Celeste. This instrument is much more Montmartre than Hogwarts. And there we go. That is genuinely contributing to the community, uh, the creator, the fellow composers, but also uh, helping us in the future to create some kind of hierarchy. The Marimba, created by Liam McLean. Back in February 2020, I went back to my old college in my hometown to speak with the students about some of the work I've done since leaving college and university. While I was there, I sampled the marimba they have. Just brilliantly recorded, amazing sounding marimba. That is what a marimba should sound like. And what's interesting about this, if you listen to the red beater, which sounds to me to be a lot softer, It doesn't sound as marimbery, and I think it's because the brighter beta. These things, I think, were developed because of tigers and stuff. So they're really amazingly fine-tuned with real kind of spatial awareness about where sounds are coming from. And I think that we have a, a kind of subconscious filing system for sounds, so that we know bad sound, good sound. And as a consequence... It's very likely the first time you hear a marimba will not be in like a shed like this. It'll be a long way for, away from you in a concert hall. So to present a, a marimba that is really close mic'd and, and really dry will not sound bad, but it'll simply sound alien. It won't fit in with the tigery filing system that we, we have. Philosophical thought there. God, I'm knackered. The last piano book sunrise nearly killed me. The Tonneau, created by Anders Wall. I'd been working on a show for a few seasons and wanted to iron out some of the hiccups I had producing the music. One thing that always stood out was the acoustic double bass. This again is a great example along with the lamp of something that has been made by a composer. It's not ma. It's a wonderful bass that we know will sit in with the track and that's what we need. Again, proof that... Um, composers uh, when they apply themselves to to tools utilities like this are always going to come out better than sounds always being a showboating kind of peacock of a sound and I guess this leads me on to the demos, the fantastic uh, demos that people are making. You would have noticed that with all of these sunrises, I really focus in on the demos that expose the instruments and help to tell their story. I would actively encourage you to continue doing that and not to maybe just find an old orchestral demo and, and slip one of these samples in. Naturally, the prime focus of these demos is 
is to hear what the sound sounds like. But what's great about us composers is is we're the storytellers. And, and, and I think that hearing a good context for the instrument is as important as the instrument itself. But moving forward, as we develop this piano book uh, production library, which is going to be totally a voluntary kind of opt-in, opt-out on a per-track basis, um, it, the whole premise of that library is going to be celebrating the instruments and the stories behind them. So delivering on, on those stories will be absolutely fantastic. And what you will start noticing over the forthcoming weeks and months is we're going to start curating the demos and pushing the stronger ones, the ones that are representative of the spirit of the instrument up to the top so that those demos can be celebrated, but also hopefully uh, be considered for the piano book uh, library, whatever that's going to be called. And one final note, if you do make and submit an instrument, I really do humbly encourage you to make a demo for it as well. We've found that people who make the instruments make the best demos because you understand the context. And the thing that we've learned with Piano Book is, is it's no point making a piano for or an instrument that, that fits all genres and all, all styles. What you tend to do is focus in on the character and you provide a real fast track to that understanding by making a demo. But also, there's gonna be a really good reason to do that coming up soon. Lots of amazing news. Right, this has been an incredible couple of months and I'm actually gonna take a little break for a while. I'm not going anywhere, but I'm resting, recuperating and building a team up here in Edinburgh. Keep demoing and I thank you so much for your commitment to this incredible community and also naturally to the amazing volunteers who without them, that this just wouldn't be possible whatsoever. Right, I stumbled across a demo the other day, which for me is my favorite piece of music that I found whilst going through this, it's not even an archive, it's a small treasure trove of instruments and music. For me, it, I love it because it's a beautiful piece of music on a beautiful instrument, but it sums up everything that I love about Piano Book, which is a celebration of imperfect just a little bit like this sunrise we've had today. Lots of love to you all and see you very soon. Do subscribe if you haven't done already and ding that bell to be notified the next time I put a video up. It won't be too long. One of those to the insane volunteers and their efforts with Piano Book. See you soon.